Come back, councillors. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Howard. Let me just... Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, um, I entered the debate to speak on item M, the Stores Board submission for the construction of South Bank and Howard Smith Wharves Ferry Terminal. And uh, Mr Chair, Council continues to deliver these major services to Brisbane residents and we're focused on providing safe and efficient travel options to get residents home quicker and safer while enjoying our beautiful city. So the investment in ferry terminals is a major contributor to this. I'm very pleased this includes a brand new terminal at Howard Smith Wharves to enhance both lifestyle and transport offerings for the people of Brisbane as we emerge from COVID-19 and rediscover our fantastic alfresco dining scenes, outdoor gatherings and relaxing with family and friends in the places that make this city so special. It also means improved active transport connectivity with a terrific link to the new farm river walk and complements a suite of new river initiatives that Council's rolling out. The new terminal will include bespoke features and finishes in harmony with the surrounding built form and the look and feel of this precinct. Upon commissioning, it will cater for cross river monohull services, but is built to also allow city cats to berth in the future. The terminal includes a modified roof form to enable uninterrupted views right across the river. There's around 5 million passengers choose to travel by ferry or city cat each year, so it's great that we are moving closer to construction of this important piece of transport infrastructure. This is all about providing more for residents to see and do, and it's just one of the many ways that Council's making the Brisbane of tomorrow even better than the Brisbane of today, and I commend it to the Chamber. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Griffiths. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I just rise to um, speak on item G, uh, the sale of 161 Kerry Road, Archfield uh, to an adjoining landowner. Uh, I just want to say uh, from the start that I won't be supporting this, um, this proposal uh, in terms of uh, there's a number of issues for that. Um, first of, uh, my first concern is that this report is uh, secret and that um, there are sections here that we can't talk about and that really I believe the public should be able to know um, what's in this report. Um, this is a significant piece of land. It's, um, it's prime real estate really uh, and the, um, the administration seems to be very interested in hiving it off um, and I understand they'll, they'll make a significant amount of money on it. Um, but it is part of a waterway and flood corridor. Uh, and um, one of the issues uh, for my ward, and my ward is very large and includes the largest area of industrial land on the south side of Brisbane, is that many of the waterways can't be maintained because they are owned privately. And um, this then allows, this creates problems for other residents and also is a is a way then for weeds to spread uh, throughout the, um, the, the whole waterway corridor. So I, I think that is really questionable what's happening here. Um, there is also the issue uh, that of its location, which is on the corner of Kerry and Beattie Roads. These are both major roads and this is a major intersection require, requiring an upgrade and um, to have traffic lights put in. Um, it uh, carries significant volumes of heavy vehicles and trucks to service the industrial area. It's obviously adjacent to the Archfield Airport, which is, has a growing industrial base on it. And uh, not far from this site is, um, is the inland uh, rail um, termination site at Acacia Ridge, which will see 40 uh, one and a half kilometre trains arrive, um, arrive in the city per day. And that equates to 5,000 heavy vehicles. So my point is that um, uh, there's, there's significant resources that are required in the local community of Archfield and Acacia Ridge, and um, I don't think um, this proposal really benefits anything that I can see other than taking away land that we have. So I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Murphy. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Chair. I uh, just rise to speak to... Uh, item C, E, K, M, and maybe if I get time and I feel lucky, I'll speak on item O as well. Uh, firstly, to item C, the Carindale Library 
Um, as the Lord Mayor said, this is a much loved uh, library in the eastern suburbs. It's one of our busiest, uh, most popular libraries. Uh, it's uh, it's an incredible asset for our community. And uh, I'm so pleased to see that the Lord Mayor uh, has announced that we will be expanding uh, the footprint. Council currently occupies the lease premises inside uh, Westfield Carindale. And the current tenancy expired, uh, sorry, commenced on the 29th of March 2012 and expires on the 12th of April 2021. The new lease uh, will commence from the 13th of April 2021 for a term of seven years. And the lessor, uh, which is Centre Group or, or Westfield uh, Carindale, as most people know them, um, has agreed, uh, offered, offered an additional premises that will allow for expansion of the library uh, from an area of uh, 1,500 square metres to approximately, or just under 2,000 uh, square metres. So uh, a significant extra chunk of real estate for our Carindale Library. Um, the new lease uh, will incorporate both the current library and the additional premises, so they will come uh, together as one. And the lessors offered gross uh, rental per square metre is below the market rentals for this type of property, reflecting uh, the community benefit that the Carindale Library uh, brings to the eastern suburbs, but also the attractor uh, that the Carindale Library provides to bring people into Westfield to shop and to conduct their business there. Um, this tenancy represents the most suitable site due to its location within a busy shopping centre, ample available car parking and good street frontage exposure. Um, Councillor Cassidy, uh, he, he made a few pot shots on this item about Jim Sawley, uh, you know, being a fantastic deal maker, getting that peppercorn rent for a dollar when the uh, library was first built. Um, but, you know, what he neglected yeah. to tell uh, the chamber is that uh, at the same time Jim Sawley was doing apparently great deals, for the Carindale Library, who was also demolishing uh, libraries out at Acacia Ridge. That is what people will remember his contribution was to libraries in Brisbane. Oh, horror, and and, um, and Councillor Owen gave a fantastic 10-minute uh, uh, lecture to this place just a few weeks ago. I remember it vividly. It was uh, it was a brilliant contribution. And Councillor Cassie, you would do well to go back to, uh, to read the minutes, to listen to the wise words uh, of Councillor Owen and uh, maybe just reflect on that before you talk up Jim Sawley's contribution to Brisbane Libraries any, ever again. Um, now to item E, uh, contracts and tendering the bus licensing agreement on the 13th of July, Stores Board approved this short-term agreement with uh, JC to Co. Now council wasn't in a position to approach the market due to the impact of COVID-19 and um, the caretaker period for Brisbane City Council elections. This eight week arrangement was established to enable council to explore uh, wider opportunities in out-of-home advertising. It gave council time to further consider and explore opportunities uh, from its various arrangements to inform a future bus advertising strategy. And it also offered council um, the opportunity to trial this new 50-50 transparency uh, for advertisements that allows this improved one-way vision out of bus windows uh, to increase the visibility for passengers. Now, the outcome of this trial uh, will assist council with determining its future bus advertising strategy. So this is a case of uh, not jumping in before we were completely ready to go uh, to market. So this eight week agreement was for a guaranteed revenue payment to council of $30,000 a week, equating to $240,000, which included no revenue share beyond um, this guaranteed amount. Council's current agreement with JC Co expires on the 10th of September, 2020. The revenue will go towards funding the operational costs of providing public transport to our customers. Purpose of the 12 plus 12 week agreement from um, the 11th of September up to the 4th is to give us that opportunity to develop the solution to address uh, the amenity, for, uh, to address the issues around amenity for passengers and their complaints around bus advertising, uh, as well as to enable that further market sounding, which I spoke about earlier. Um, on item E, uh, I think Councillor Cassidy said that uh, he didn't support us. Um, he didn't support this this contract going to a French multinational. And as is outlined in the submission, and um, you know, if you'd taken time to read it, you would have understood that um, the French multinational is the only one in this market uh, at the moment. There is no um, you know local Australian competitor that does this stuff. Um, so we really didn't have a lot of choice here. That's why we're going and doing this market sounding post COVID on the opportunity that potentially the market uh, will improve. Uh, but at the moment, uh, we all have to understand and agree that uh, there isn't a lot uh, in this market for council to pursue. So uh, we, will, uh, we will watch and wait. We'll see this extension through and um, we'll follow it up when it's done. Now, 
Uh, to item K, which is the single source submission for the bus advertising license agreement. Um, the purpose of this submission is to enter into a contract or a sole source arrangement in accordance with council's uh, procurement policy. We have uh, approximately 1,150 buses in council's fleet and um, they support bus advertising. Licence agreement is in place that allows JC to co, which is formerly AP and Outdoor, to sell and display advertisements on allocated vehicles in council's bus fleet. And um, that agreement also expires on the 10th of September. Um, this submission will allow council to work with JC to co on a better product, uh, hand in hand. Purpose of this contract is to give council that, again, that further opportunity to address um, the amenity. So uh, the reason for the sole source is just to assist council on this decision around bus advertising. So we've engaged Nexus Factor, a specialist advertising consultancy to provide uh, a market report. And we anticipate that that will be back in uh, due course for us to commence uh, that market process, uh, hopefully a bit closer to the end of COVID. Um, now on to item M, um, the submission before us here is to enter a contract with uh, Fitzgerald Constructions Australia to construct the South Bank and Howard Smith Wharves ferry terminals. A post-market submission before us today includes amendments made to the SCP in order to boost our economy and to create local jobs. And the original SCP for these projects was approved by Council on the 15th of October uh, last year and our city has under, undergone a great deal of change since then. That's why we've increased the local benefit weighting from 20% to 30% to back the local economy and um, I thank uh, Crossbench and Labor Councils for their support on this item. Um, with the preferred tender of Fitzgerald, we're set to create more than 100 local jobs, which is a much needed boost to our local economy. This $30 million investment in new and upgraded ferry terminals is part of our commitment to supporting local industry through this challenging pandemic. With more than 5.4 million people travelling by ferry every year, river-based transport is a, a major part of Brisbane's unique lifestyle experience. The awarding of uh, this tender supports the Lord Mayor's local by procurement policy, which is getting businesses back on their feet and directly benefiting local employment opportunities. Local buy has been an immense success. Nearly 80% of procurement dollars are now spent locally in the 2019-20 financial year. And this administration is committed to ensuring um, that our terminals are world-class and as efficient as possible. Both terminals will allow for dual birthing of city cats and uh, our newly, newly announced kitty cats uh, with the Howard Smith Wharfs terminal initially catering uh, for Cross River services. Um, Fitzgerald Australia is a locally based team and they will contract up to 33 local suppliers from right here in Brisbane and Ipswich to fabricate the pontoons and the gangways for both of these terminals. This submission represents a critical step towards further enhancing our ferry network and providing new lifestyle and leisure opportunities for people visiting two very popular precincts, the Howard Smith Wharves and South Bank. And it comes at a time when our local economy needs it most as we weather uh, the effects of coronavirus. In June, the Lord Mayor announced that this administration is investing 14.6 million to deliver new and upgraded ferry terminals. And ferry terminal at Howard Smith Wharves is a priority in order to support this busy precinct to ensure residents and visitors have easy access uh, to what is fast becoming uh, one of Brisbane's most attractive destinations. At the same time, we're ensuring the South Bank terminal meets the needs of the precinct now and into the future. Both of these new terminals will transform our river's edge and be wonderful assets for resident, residents and visitors to travel along our river with on-site work to begin early next year. Construction is expected to commence off-site immediately with an on-site presence at both locations due early next year, subject to weather and construction conditions. And then finally, just on item O, um, this is the uh, public business intelligence uh, system, otherwise known as um, NetBI, which is the Brisbane Transport Incident Management System. And it is coming to council uh, because to get a better deal from the supply, which is Brisbane based, we had to sign a longer contract. Uh, hence, it's here to council for full approval. And uh, I hope that all councils will be supporting uh, this very valuable system to provide instant supporting to Transport for Brisbane, contracted with a great local company. The other reason that they should support it is it's mandated by TransLink. So you kind of have to. Thanks very much, Chair. Further speakers? Further speakers? All right, I'll now put uh, items C, I, M and O. C, I, M 
and O. All those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. On item E, all those in favour of item E, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Division Chair. Councillor Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. All those in favour of item E, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it, hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 20 in favour, one against and five abstentions. The ayes have it. On item K, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Called by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Cassidy. Please ring the bells. All those in favour of item K, please say aye and raise your hand and hold it there so it may be counted. Aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so they may be counted. Aye. Uh -huh. Clarks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 19 in favour and seven against. The ayes have it. On item G, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Cassidy. Please ring the bells. Item G, all those in favour, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. Aye. And those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Blacks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour, and one against, and six abstentions. The ayes have it. On item N, all those in favour, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. 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 Thank you. And all those against, please say no, raise, uh, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. That concludes the ENC report. Councillors, the city planning report, please. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnson. Yeah, uh, yeah, what about item N? Which one? N for Nicole. I just did it just now. Wasn't that M for... No, no, it was Mary? definitely N. We did N. We did M uh, with the group at the beginning. Okay, we did M. We did C, I, M and O together and then we did N last. Okay. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I was sure you said M, and I voted on the basis that that was M, and I'm I'm really sorry. I need to know how we can correct that because oh, I to intended to vote no for M. That's why I asked N for Nicole. So that that sounded like M to me. I apologise that you misheard me, but uh, it was clearly N, and we had voted on M sometime earlier. Well. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, I'm just going to say that it's extremely difficult to understand or hear everything that's going on. And I would just ask that my vote for, for if that was in the last one, um, I, I, vote, I voted no. I want to vote no for N, and I just want to make that very clear. Um, and I would ask that the record is corrected to reflect my vote. Um, but yes, please, I'll discuss it with the officers in a moment. Um, can I please have the Deputy Mayor move uh, the report for the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, please? Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the City Planning and Economic Development Committee minutes held on Tuesday, the 1st of September 2020, be adopted. Amen. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Hammond, that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of September 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And uh, contrary to the Leader of the Opposition's comment that nothing of substance comes through the Planning Committee, in recent weeks we've had the uh, BRIS plan, we've had the full explanation of the new Development Eye program that has been rolled out across your ward offices, and last week we had the detailed presentation of the green incentives that we have already discussed here today. So maybe you should take some time to join us on a Tuesday morning. Uh, the committee presentation, as I said, went through the green incentives in details with many other comments. Uh, Sorry, I'm just conscious the chair's changing. The I think there's a chairman. point of order, Councillor. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, Councillor Adam. Councillor Johnson, your point of order, please. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Mr Deputy Chairman. Um, I seek leave to suspend standing orders uh, in order to allow me to move an urgency motion appointing uh, Councillor Cassidy to the Planning Committee. And I need a seconder. Oh, thanks, Councillor Griffith. It's been moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Griffith, that Councillor Cassidy be appointed to uh, the uh, planning committee. Uh, Councillor Johnson, do you have that uh, motion in an email? Can you send that? Uh, to it's, a, it's an urgency motion. That's all I've got. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't accept it unless you send it through in writing, please. You, you can. Um, it doesn't have to be in writing, and this is a very simple, I know, very I'm, simple. I'm pretty sure that we've established in this place that with urgency motions, they are submitted to the CCLO in writing. That's, that's not what the rules say, Mr Deputy Chairman. They don't have to be in writing if they are uh, simple, and it's a genuine urgency motion. I appreciate that, uh, Councillor Johnson, but uh, if it's not in writing at this point in, start, at this point in time, we'll continue on uh, with the business of the Chamber. <sighs> that's ridiculous. Um, Mr Chairman, Thank I move you. dissent in your ruling. Uh, it's, been moved. it's been moved by Councillor Johnson, second by Councillor Shri. A motion of dissent in my order. All those in favour, say aye. 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 Against? I believe the noes have it. <laughs> the ice at it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Adams. Thank you. Uh, Point of order, Chair. Deputy Chair. Point of order, Councillor Shree. Thanks. Just for my understanding, just so I can be clear on the rules, you're saying that, it, like, what section of the meeting's local law requires that urgency motions have to be submitted in writing? I think it's been quite established by the uh, Chamber previously that we have had motions come through in urgency yeah. through to the CCLOs in writing. That has been no. That's so, that's what council. That's not what the rules say. That's what Councillor Wines said to me last week when I moved an urgency motion. So again, Mr. Deputy Chairman, this is about what the rules say, not what Councillor Wines did last week. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Sorry, I was I was I was just seeking guidance, um, Mr. Deputy Chair. But I, 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 it sounds like what you're saying is that there's an established practice of, that that's how urgency motions are are handled in this place. That is correct. Right. And and I guess what I might seek to understand is that that hasn't been established practice up until recently. So are you saying that there's been a, a change to the established practice in the last couple of weeks? No, that uh, as at, it, that's, that's the current convention. But like I, I've moved urgency motions many times in this chamber yeah. without putting them in writing. 
Sorry, Councillor Shree, I'd like to get the meeting moving along. So um, but, we'll continue. But, but you, you do have Deputy to. Deputy Chairman, you're saying there's some sort of convention when that's contrary to what the rules of procedure are saying. You, no, we're not, we're not going to get into a debate. Councillor Adams, can you please continue? Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Um, obviously, we're under very, very different circumstances in Zoom meetings, something the convention has obviously changed a lot of things in the last few weeks. And it's been made very, very clear that if you are to submit any type of emergency, urgency or otherwise, it is submitted through CLO on an email to be considered. It's not a matter of um, debate now. Yeah, exactly. It's not what the rules of procedure it's say. You're given a ruling, you're a self-appointed chair now, Councillor Adams. I was just talking about something that had occurred in the meeting as I am now in my chair's report, and I'll continue if it's okay. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Do the report, please, Councillor Adams. Thank you, and I can speak around my area as well, and one of my area is the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, and we have the ability to have another person on my committee. However, they are totally uninterested, and again, find it that she is... Uh, through you, Ms. Deputy Chair, that uh, Councillor Johnson uh, doesn't support the Green Initiatives but can't be bothered to join my committee Point and hear all Mr. about Deputy it um, as she was offered that position and has Mr. refused Mr. to take it up. Point of order, Councillor Johnson. I'm not in this report, Mr Deputy Chairperson, and I would ask you to draw Councillor Adams back to the substance of the motion instead of choosing to abuse me. Uh, this is Councillor Adams' portfolio, and she does have the ability to talk around her portfolio. Councillor Adams. I'm not in her portfolio, thanks very much. And this is not in the report what, before point us. Of order, today. Chair. <laughs> point Council, of order, Chair. Point of order, Chair. Just deal with one point of order at a time, please. And I'd appreciate if you just hold a moment. Councillor Johnson, the Deputy Mayor has the ability to talk around her report. Okay, so we we are going to continue along with the business of the meeting. Councillor Shree, your point of order, please. Thanks, Chair. I'm I'm just clarifying. Just we didn't quite get to it before, but section twelve of the meetings local law procedure at meetings, subsection three allows a councillor proposing yes. to suspend standing rules by yes. way of motion. They that that's very clear in the meetings local law. So even if there is some some kind of chairman's ruling to the contrary it can't overrule that written element of the meetings sure. local law yeah. so there's a, there there's a mechanism for a for conventions to be established where the local law is silent but in a context where the local law quite specifically sets up a framework <laughs> you can't vary that local law otherwise you're just making up rules that you conflict can. with the the act yeah, council at council three where the men, uh, where their laws are silent, it is at the discretion of the chairman. But my point is that the rule, the, the laws aren't silent, Deputy Chair. The laws very the the local law very clearly establishes a, a procedure for right. councillors to propose to suspend standing rules. Yep. It is at the discretion of the chairman. <laughs> matters that are silent in the meeting. No, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Deputy Chair, can you please seek legal advice on this because. I, I'm concerned that you're providing incorrect information to the chamber. The first and time in 12 years that we've been told we can't move an urgency motion was last week. Councillor so Johnson. no convention. There was a rule last week. That was it. Well, Councillor Shree, I'll find that advice and I'll get that advice to you. In the meantime, Councillor Adams, can we continue with the meeting, please? Sure. Thank you, Chair. And I draw Councillor Adams back to the content within the report. Please. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Chair. As the Chair of Planning and Economic Development Committee, excuse me, <clears throat> I am speaking about my committee. As I am under the local laws allowed to do, thank you, Councillor Johnson and Councillor Shree, for your expertise um, through you, Deputy Chair. But as the Chair of this committee, I'm allowed to talk about who was in my committee and who was not in my committee and what happens in my committee and what does not happen in my committee. And I'm talking about the committee meeting last week, which was around the green incentives and uh, the disappointment that Councillor Johnson continues to snipe at me about planning issues when she can't be bothered to turn up to my committee when she was invited as a member of this committee. I'm not on your committee, therefore I'm not part of your portfolio. No, so take your abuse no and go elsewhere. No interjections. 
Point, any... point of order, point of order, Mr. Deputy Chair. I sorry, Council Owen, I don't uphold your point of order. Please, yeah, I'd like to oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Um, just on a um, a comment that Councillor Johnston seems to be repeating, she is imputing motive, stating that she is being abused. That is not the case, and oh. I ask you to ask her to withdraw that, please. What? Sorry, Councillor Owen, I didn't hear what Councillor Johnson was saying because I'm still addressing some information that I'm seeking for Councillor Shree. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Can we go back to Councillor Adams, please? Please. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Again, I will talk about what happens in my committee and the invitation <coughs> that has been made to Councillor Johnson to be on my committee, but she has refused that invitation and last week we spoke about the green incentives, which she did not support today and will not support without even bothering to be on the planning committee. I think uh, her comments are very clear about what she thinks about that committee. Um, we have debated this already and uh, I see that the majority of us uh, do definitely support these incentives going forward. Obviously, um, there are some people that do not support them, but in general, um, an abstention, which we saw for the majority of the uh, items that were in, in uh, E and C today from the ALP, obviously means they're going to sit on the fence um, as they always do and not commit to anything, which is why when they didn't commit to anything 10 months ago and spent $2 million on the election promise, the people of Brisbane didn't commit to them either. So I commend the incentives to the Chamber. There's three petitions that were in the committee last week as well. Um, they've been supported, the recommendations supported by each of the um, councillors concerned, and I'll leave that debate to the Chamber. Is there further debate? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Deputy Chair. And I think maybe the Deputy Mayor needs a lie down. It's a little too late, um, this kind of behaviour, I think, uh, Deputy Chair. Point I'd like order. to speak on clause D. Point of order, Mr Deputy <laughs> Chair. Adams. Last week, the laughing councillor in the corner, Councillor Griffiths, called me love. And this week, Councillor right Cassidy considers me to be a lie down. I find it offensive. And if Councillor Cook I said, that from I said, one I of think us, you she need would be a out lie down. Mind. That's a bit different. You dish it out and you can't take it. Come on. Silence, please. <laughs> Councillor Adams, uh, Councillor Cassidy did say that you did need a lie down. Um, <laughs> and I find that offensive, Council, uh, Mr Deputy Chair, and I ask he withdraw. Councillor Cassidy, would you care to withdraw the statement? Uh, sure, Chair, if you'd, uh, Deputy Chair, if you'd like me to, out of an abundance of caution, I'll withdraw the statement that the Deputy Mayor needs a lie down. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, can you continue, please? Thank, thank you very much, Deputy Chair. I'd like to speak on clause uh, D, uh, a petition requesting Council provide full support for ramp attack uh, to continue to operate in the industrial areas of Jibung, Virginia and Zilmia. Uh, this uh, petition uh, makes it very clear that the community has a strong desire to see ramp attacks stay in our community. Uh, there was over 7,000 signatures on a change.org petition, uh, 500 supportive comments on that and, and over 840 people signed this council petition that I initiated. I detailed my strong support for ramp attack to continue to operate uh, in the industrial areas of Jibung, uh, Zulmia and Virginia like they have uh, for the best part of the last decade. They are established uh, and have shown that um, not only um, is this industrial area where they um, have been operating in a good place for them to operate, it's just about the only place they can operate. They can't be expected to move into a vacant shop uh, down in Zulmia or Sandgate. They need space and they need to be able to make some noise. Uh, they give kids of all ages a safe and enjoyable space to learn to skate and scoot and have, um, over their time, uh, supported so many different community activities. They have received commitments from uh, the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor that they will be supported to continue operating in my ward, and uh, I can guarantee that the community will be holding this administration to account if this commitment is broken. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, Councillor Shri, regarding uh, your request around the requirement to send in a, uh, a motion in writing, 
Uh, it was agreed to in the chamber under the good order of video conferencing of council and committee meeting guidelines that is published on ASDEC documents. And I'll read it as follows. Urgency and amendment motions. If a councillor successfully moves an urgency motion or an amendment motion, a copy of the wording of the motion is to be immediately emailed to the council and committees at brisbane.qld.gov.au to facilitate the chair and the clerks in the administration of the motion. A copy of the amendment uh, motion will then be forwarded to all meeting participants to the ward office email addresses. Uh, point, point of, of order, order, Chair. Yeah, you just, you stuffed up massively because what you just said is different to what you just did to us. Councillor we can move urgency Councillor. and if an, if a substantial... Sorry, Councillor Shree, your point of order. I, I was just clarifying that, that that section applies if the urgency motion is successful. So my understanding would be that that's if yes. an urgency motion is moved and then that urgency is successful in being established then the text of the motion has to be sent through if it's but but, but the text of the urgency mode that that, yeah, that would does. seem to be a nonsense because how, how can someone move an urgency motion urgently on the spot yes. while also having it written up in advance it reads as if a if a councillor successfully moves why well, you you wouldn't let me move it that's the point i wasn't able to move urgent is there any is there any further business? Any further debate? Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Johnson. Mr. Chairman, in your own words, you have um, unlawfully refused to allow an urgency motion. Um, I'm seeking leave to suspend standing orders to move the urgency motion, which does not have to be in writing. It is only if that is successful that those good order. Um, rules you're referring to say it has to be in writing. So what you are telling us and what you are doing are two different things and you are clearly in breach of the meetings local law and the special rules that you brought in. I think she is actually right on this, to be fair. Councillor Shri, can we just deal with one at a time, please? And, and I appreciate no interruption. Thank you, thank you Councillor Johnson. Uh, I'll read it again. If a councillor successfully moves an urgency motion or an amendment motion, a copy of the wording of the motion is to be immediately emailed to councillors, oh, so, sorry, to council committee and Brisbane, qld.gov.au to facilitate the clerks and the chairs in the administration of the motion. Point of order, Chair. One an act of disorder is to raise or call excessive point of order. Okay, can I have that, please? Section twenty one. Uh, mm -hmm. Councillors, uh, can I remind you that under section 21.1 F, ra raising or calling excessive points of order uh, is an act of disorder under this section. Can we, is there a further debate? Are you seriously not going to allow this to proceed? Yes. Can we have further debate, please? Well, I move dissent in your completely dodgy ruling. You clearly, Stephen, don't know what you're doing. A I'm point sorry. of order. Councillor Johnson needs to use the correct terms in this place as she completely reminds Why? us the chairman all doesn't the time. Have to use the correct Mr. Rules. Deputy Chair. Why would I bother? The it's rules are there to protect us all, and that's how we are supposed to run the meeting. But the chairman won't allow the meeting to be run in accordance with the rules. And all you need to do is email through your motion and we can act on it. I'm just seconding that dissent motion. 
Thank you. Yeah. So we've had a motion moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Shree. A motion of dissent. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. All those against? No. No. Division. Uh, division. Division called by Councillor Johnson and seconded by Councillor Shree. Ring the bells, please. Wow. Uh, all those in favour of the motion, please raise your hand and hold it there to be counted, please. All those against? Parks, can you please read the results when ready? Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being six in favour and 19 against. Thank you. Is there any further debate? Councillor Adams. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And just summing up, thank you, Councillor oh, Cassidy. Point of order, for the point of order Chair. Hand up. She, oh. she, she did have her hand up to speak. Sorry, Councillor Johnson. Oh, it, it fades in and out. It's a bit hard to tell. Please go ahead. Right. Honestly, um, I rise to speak on item A. Um, as the chairperson of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, seem to. Um, uh, not listen to what I said in the ENC debate. I thought I would put it on the record again uh, in this committee. Um, firstly, I do not support the, uh, the incentives program as it has been set up by the LNP. Um, this was announced by the Lord Mayor on the 17th of June and two months later, um, a scheme has been put into place. Um, we heard the Lord Mayor explain earlier today, or Councillor Adams, I'm not sure which one it was, but uh, we heard them explain earlier today that there'd been consultation with developers um, and that consultation was extensive. Um, and I'm sure that it was over the last two months. There's been lots of lovely chats with the developers about how this council can subsidise uh, their uh, business arrangements. Um, but let me be clear, whilst the idea here... Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Deputy Chair. Point of order, Councillor Adams. Claim to be misrepresented. Noted. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Um, uh, so whilst um, the intention here might be a good one to ensure that there are um, more sustainable and environmentally friendly buildings in Brisbane, um, the tool that the council is using in this case or the LMP are proposing to use in this case um, is not um, is not the best outcome um, we're, we're, we're going to see infrastructure charges lost um, where we need to be building community assets um, and assets for the city uh, we're getting a policy that allows an out clause for the LNP that they can even if these buildings don't comply with all the requirements in the policy, uh, you can get um, you can get the subsidies anyway. Um, the oversight and transparency attached to this portfolio uh, policy has been delegated to the CEO, who will delegate it away to more junior officers. And we're not putting in place the right framework and infrastructure um, within the city planning documents and within the codes to ensure that these buildings will have proper sustainability outcomes delivered in them. That needs to be done through the instrument of city plan and through the Queensland Development Code. And as I outlined earlier, 
um, it certainly um, is incumbent upon this council to take a leadership role. Obviously, the state government would have to do their part, um, but as the LNP loves to attack George Street, I'm sure that they could do so on something useful, um, like changing the Queensland Development Code to make sure there are sustainability measures um, in those requirements. Now, earlier in the debate, um, uh, we certainly heard um, you know, why I was wrong and why all the other councillors were wrong. And, um, you know, it's just a clear difference of opinion about how we go about achieving the aim here of sustainable buildings and, and providing um, payback uh, to um, developers um, does not strike me as the best course of action. It doesn't represent value for money. Um, it certainly uh, reduces council's revenue. It reduces the amount of infrastructure that can be built. Um, and we don't necessarily get the right outcome um, with the actual buildings. So I think this administration has got this wrong. Um, it doesn't surprise me um, because, uh, you know, this administration has taken city planning in this um, council in the wrong direction. Um, one of the worst pieces of um, legislation or, or bylaws that's come through this council in my 12 years has been city plan 2014. Um, that was a week long debate and it, it's, it's been a terrible outcome for our city. Um, this LNP administration brought in a whole range of new rules and, and it's only in the last year that they've started backflipping on some of those. Um, they, they are not taking city planning in the right direction in our city um, and it is incredibly disappointing um, that they've rushed this policy in, that they've only spoken to developers about this um, and instead of putting in place... Point of order, Mr Deputy Chair. Point of order, Councillor Adams. Claim to be misrepresented again. No, I did. Councillor Johnson? Didn't didn't mention her, so can I just check, is that really a point of misrepresentation if Councillor Adams is not mentioned? Councillor Johnson, you have the floor. I'm seeking a point of order, Mr Chairman. Is it a point of misrepresentation if Councillor Adams wasn't mentioned? Can you please continue? You have the floor. You have the right point to... Point of order, Mr Deputy point Chairman. Thank you. Is it really a uh, misrepresentation if I did not mention Councillor Adams? We'll get to that at the end when Councillor Adams makes a representation. Can you please continue? Uh, Mr Deputy Chairman, I'm making a point of order and I'm asking you as a matter of Maybe. procedure, under the rules of procedure, yeah. if I do not mention the Councillor... Councillor Johnson, you've made excessive point of orders during the, this meeting and... I am actually asking you to continue. Mr Deputy I Chairman, I would like a ruling on the point of order. I'm entitled to one. I have also reminded you that making excessive point of orders is an act of disorder. Please continue. But you haven't made a ruling on the first no, point of order I've made. Order. Please continue. Are you refusing to make a ruling on the point of order, Mr Deputy Chairman? I just made a point of order on your point of order. Can you please continue? Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Shree. Claim to be misrepresented. Yep. Claim to be misrepresented. Thank you, Councillor Shree. Councillor Johnson, can you please continue? Yeah, claim to be misrepresented. Your pettiness is unbelievable. Councillor Adams. Councillor Johnson, please continue. Oh, what is the point? Councillor Adams. Oh, yes, sum up. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Oh, no, claims to be misrepresented. Uh, twice, Councillor uh, Johnson stated that the only people we spoke to were developers. We spoke to no developers. We spoke to the Property Council, the UDIA, and major stakeholders within the industry. Thank you. Councillor Shree, your misrepresentation? No, that's fine. Thank you. Councillor Adams, wrap up. Thank you very much. What um, about my misrepresentation? Oh. No, Councillor Councillor Johnson. I don't believe you've made excessive. <clears throat> pardon me. You've made excessive points of order and been quite disruptive through the meeting. You've been warned that excessive point of orders are an act of disorder. Councillor Adams, please continue. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Um, 
as I say, and Councillor Cassidy um, uh, spoke to his petition and yes, we have absolutely committed to supporting Ramp Attack uh, in any way we possibly can. This is a, uh, a business, a sport and rec business in industrial and I was involved 10 years ago uh, when uh, long before Councillor Cassidy was in the area as well uh, to support them in where they are at the moment, which is um, industrial uh, B, I think, when they first set up. Uh, the sport and reckon in the industrial area. Uh, the area they had the application in for that they moved to recently was industrial C. And industrial C, as we know in this place, is for heavy industry, uh, which is a restricted area uh, and not a lot of it in Brisbane, particularly around the Virginia area. Um, something we do uh, need to protect in certain areas to make sure we have the ability for those wanting to do industrial C so they don't impact specifically on residential areas. Uh, therefore, we were working through the development application and I did meet uh, with the ramp attack owners about how maybe not the most suitable site. Uh, another site came up, unfortunately didn't um, eventuate. So we were working through this one to see what we could do. But before we continued, they withdrew the application. But uh, as other opportunities come up, yes, we will be supporting ramp attack and uh, we'd love to see them stay uh, in the northern suburbs where they are now because they do have a great following. And uh, as I said to them myself, as an XPE teacher, more than supportive for all types of sport and rec, indoor, outdoor and every other type you can think uh, to make sure the, the kids and the older, I know there's a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, adults that enjoy ramp attack as well. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Uh, Councillors, as it's approaching nine o'clock, uh, the meeting will automatically stand adjourn unless we agree to continue the sitting. Is it the will of the council that this sitting of council proceed beyond 9 p.m.? All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Uh, those against? The ayes have it. The meeting will now continue. Uh, we'll put the Deputy Mayor's uh, motion. All those in favour of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee report? Raise your right Aye. hand. Aye. Thank you. Those against? The ayes have it. We move on to, sorry, I'll give me one second. Uh, Councillor Murphy, please. Thanks, uh, Chair. I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting dated the 1st of September 2020 be adopted. Seconded. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Owen, that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of September 2020, be adopted. Council Murphy. Thanks, Chair. Um, just before we move on to the substantive debate, I want to address an incident which occurred today in the city. As media have been reporting, at approximately 9.45 a.m., a motorcyclist collided with one of our buses at the intersection of Skew Street at Roma Street, and sadly, the motorcyclist died at the scene. On behalf of Council, I would like to offer my sympathies and condolences to the family and friends of the man who has lost his life in these very tragic circumstances. Um, our thoughts are also with the driver of the council vehicle that was involved in the accident and support has been offered to that driver. All our drivers are part of the Transport for Brisbane family and when incidents like this occur, uh, I think we all feel it. We will await the outcome of the Queensland Police Service investigation into this death. And of course, we will act on any recommendations should they be made by the QPS or the coroner in due course. Now, Chair, um, last week's committee presentation was on Love to Ride Brisbane, which commenced last Tuesday. Um, before I begin, Councillor Shri inquired about the participation numbers of the program. And I will be addressing uh, those numbers throughout my report today, and I'm happy to provide that a copy to him as well if he's interested. So uh, Love to Ride is a fantastic global change uh, behaviour program. 2020 marks the third instalment of Love to Ride Brisbane, which is organised by the Cycling Brisbane team here in Council. As in 2018 and 2019, this year Love to Ride Brisbane will run throughout the month of September. And it's a public participation program, and it's all about getting on your bike and encouraging others to do the same. It's a fun, free challenge to encourage workmates, friends and family to experience the benefits of riding a bike. 
Last year, approximately 475,000 people participated across 12 countries. The program is workplace-based and it uses peer support and encourages long-term shifts in riding behaviour. It's open to anyone who lives or works in Brisbane. Workplaces can also register and compete to see who can get the most people riding bikes. Love to Ride highlights the health, environmental and financial benefits of cycling and the success of Love to Ride Brisbane is evident in the numbers and testimonials. In 2018, there were 2,327 participants from 221 organisations. 2019 saw an increase in participation, workplaces and new riders. Last year, 2,858 participants from 253 organisations took part. That included 290 brand new riders, which is a terrific result. Collectively, um, Brisbane rode over 800,000 kilometres across 38,000 trips. That's the equivalent of going around the world 15 times. Rather than driving those kilometres, um, we've saved around 50,000 kilos of carbon from going into the atmosphere. And it also helped to reduce the number of cars on our roads. Of riding in the program, participants have said, I enjoy starting and finishing the day along the riverside. Uh, it's a great way to explore and to enjoy Brisbane. And I have City Cycle on my doorstep and I love playing tour guide for my family from Perth. 99% of participants said that they would take part in the challenge again, and we are looking forward to welcoming them back this year. Love to Ride is a great way to explore Brisbane's many bikeways and shared pathways. Um, I have uh, some figures. Uh, so Atlanta in 2015 had 252 organisations and 1,846 people. Adelaide in 2015 had 183 organisations and uh, 1,869 people. Gold Coast had 110 organisations and 1,200 people. Um, but the number one city, or I, I shouldn't say city, the number one state uh, for uh, love to ride in the world is actually Oregon. And in 2019, they had 809 organisations and uh, 11,308 people participate in Love to Ride. So um, Queensland, I think, has a long way to go to catch up to Oregon, but I think um, Brisbane is certainly up to the challenge of taking on Portland, and I'd love uh, to see us do that. Now, finally, uh, Chair, this week we heard um, some great porkies from the Labor State Government uh, on the weekend. They've claimed that uh, there'll be a commercial pontoon delivered at Howard Smith Wars before Christmas to get residents to Moreton Bay in 40 minutes. Of course, that is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, a commercial vessel's top speed is 24.9 knots. And you wouldn't even make it to the mouth of the Brisbane River in that time, let alone uh, make it all the way out to Moreton Bay. As usual, there's been uh, no practicality or feasibility studies behind this. And apparently 5.5 million will cover the cost of three uh, enormous commercial pontoons. Um, that this has never been a priority. And let's not forget that um, Labor have voted against Howard Smith Wharves in this chamber in 2015, precinct which sees 100,000 visitors every day and has created more than 1,000 jobs. State Labor have always opposed it, but lately it appears that they are now walking it back on Howard Smith Wharves. So seven weeks from an election, we see another pipe dream. And as is typical of Labor, there's been no detailed design, no development application, uh, no real plans and no commercial application for what they're putting in. Um, meanwhile, this administration is committed to providing more than $12 million to deliver the new ferry terminal at Howard Smith Wharves to support our tourism industry and, of course, to ensure easy access to this public space. Our terminal is not a pipe dream. It's very real. And I thank uh, councillors for supporting it through the chamber today. I know administration councillors are looking forward to seeing it delivered in a realistic time frame this term. Um, and with that, Chair, I will leave the debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? Further speakers? I see none. Councillor Murphy. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye and raise it in your hand. And those aye. against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. We'll move to the Infrastructure Committee report, please. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 1st of September 2020, be adopted. Seconded. 
It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Maddock that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of September 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor McLaughlin. I'll let the report stand. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Griffiths. Councillor Griffiths? Sorry, just trying. The unmute button wasn't working. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to speak uh, just uh, on the petition that went through last week and is coming before council this week in relation to um, a residence petition that they want to preserve Northgate Road Arbor by stopping oversized vehicles using Northgate Road, Northgate as a thoroughfare between Sandgate and Toomble Roads. Um, look, we thought the response was fairly weak uh, and really didn't didn't signal that they were going to be doing anything for residents. Um, this seems to have been an ongoing problem for a road that um, that does carry heavy traffic, but that is well loved by locals and who are keen to preserve the arbour along the road. So um, uh, we won't be uh, won't be supporting the recommendation here, and would ask that the vote is take, taken seriatim for item B. Thank you. Item B. Take a seriatim for voting. Yes, thank you. Yep. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to speak um, briefly about the LATM program, which is the, the subject of this committee presentation. Um, I just wanted to highlight for particularly the Lord Mayor, if he's still in the chamber, but also draw to the attention of Councillor Murphy as well as Councillor McLaughlin. The fact that the design and delivery costs for these LATM projects are now very, very high to the point where um, a lot of residents I talk to about how expensive speed bumps are, that they're just genuinely flabbergasted that it can cost upwards of sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 simply to do design work on these projects. Um, so I'm, I'm not offering that as a specific criticism of any individual chair or councillor, but just want to acknowledge that there's a systemic problem here where in my ward, I probably have about 20 streets that I could consider quite high priorities for LATM, LATM work and another 30 or 40 streets that I think will need LATM work over the coming few years. Um, but the council is only doing half a dozen LATM projects per year, which is clearly not going to be keeping up with demand. So um, I don't want to labour the point right now. I realise it's late, but there is a broader issue here and maybe it would be good for... Councillor McLaughlin and Councillor Murphy to put their heads together about how they can bring down the costs of those projects and particularly the design costs so that it becomes feasible to do a few more of these each year. Obviously, I'm of the view that we should be increasing funding for these LATA projects and decreasing our funding for some of the major road widening and, and infrastructure widening uh, in, and intersection widening projects. But um, yeah, re regardless of whether we can find more money to put into this program, I think the fact that such essentially small pieces of infrastructure are now costing close to $100,000 each to deliver is, is clearly a problem um, and I think raises serious questions about how we're administering this project. And I think there needs to be a rethinking of the, the entire program in order to bring down those costs because this isn't viable. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor McLaughlin? I'll now put the resolution for item A. All those in favour of item A, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it on item B. All those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. The ayes have it in both instances. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Strunk. Please ring the bells. Councillors, in regards to item B, all those in favour, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. Aye. Right. 
Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand and hold no. it there. So you can be counted. No. Thank you. Clarks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 18 in favour and six against. The ayes have it. The ayes have it on both items A and on item and B. Uh, that concludes that report. Councillors, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Com Committee, please. Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 1st of September 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Davis, that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of September 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr Chair. Last week, our committee received a presentation from Nigel Chamier, Chair of Oxley Creek Transformation. As many councillors will know, the project turns 20 kilometres of Oxley Creek Corridor into a world-class green destination at a cost of $20 million over, tw oh, sorry, $100 million over 20 years. It's getting late. I recently updated the chamber on the new Worrell Parkland at Lara Pinta, the first major project to be completed. Nigel commented on estimated attendance figures with thousands of visitors in the first few weeks. I want to thank the Oxley Creek Transformation Board and staff for their outstanding work so far. The committee also had uh, one petition requesting council designate land at the corner of Bow Desert Road and Evans Road, Marika as park. And I'll leave the rest to the chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Griffiths? Yep. On. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be really quick, but um, the petition that went through this week um, had the support of over 800 residents, um, and uh, it's about turning some road reserve land that's owned by TMR uh, into parkland. I think this is setting a precedent for the, certainly for many people in the city. So uh, it was glad to see that the administration actually supported this, and I um, welcome Councillor Cunningham uh, being open to that. I've written to the state uh, minister for um, main roads uh, with regards to this particular site and also the um, the local member, which is uh, Peter Russo, seeking their support so that this land can come over from the state and uh, be formally um, looked after as parkland by Brisbane City Council. I have a history group and residents who are keen to name the site and to do a history project on the land. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I just rise to speak on item A, the Oxley Creek Transformation uh, Project. Um, a very significant uh, proportion of the Oxley Creek Transformation Project is now happening within Tennyson Ward. Um, my ward boundaries were amended at the um, recent council election and uh, the new southern boundary is the um, uh, Ipswich Motorway. Um, and that brings a very uh, additional significant portion of the project into uh, Tennyson Ward. We are yet to see any of the benefits of the Oxley Creek Transformation Project in Tennyson Ward. Uh, to date, there has been one public consultation session uh, last year in um, uh, the Graceful Riverside Parklands at the Boat Park. Uh, and uh, there was supposed to be a draft master plan released for public consultation in April. Um, and at this stage, the Oxley Creek Transformation Company is unable to tell me when it plans to release the, um, release the master plan for Graceful. I asked, I rang and asked them last week after I saw the matter come through our committee. Um, there are also some issues, I think, uh, with what's happening um, with respect to this uh, project at the moment. And it appears that they've built some very lovely um, play equipment um, in uh, a couple of locations. Um, but as I feared when this project was, was first being um, consulted and developed, um, nothing has been done, to my knowledge, to improve the health of the waterway corridor itself. Uh, and uh, we don't see the environmental plan that was one of the six key projects identified 
uh, delivered. Um, and certainly uh, we're not seeing uh, necessarily any uh, projects to improve the, um, the health of the corridor. I understand there have been a few tree planting projects in certain places, but that certainly doesn't go far enough. In, in my ward, it's still the bush care, the volunteer bush care groups that are doing all the hard work. Um, equally, we're not seeing the Greenway project um, progressing, uh, and that is unfortunate. Um, the area that I raised with Councillor Marks now, I don't know, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, to be fixed, still haven't heard back from her, and she says, oh, only, you only told me a few days ago. Well, it's been weeks now and I haven't heard back. Um, you know, that's part of this track area. And at the moment, it's dangerous. People were hurt. Um, bush carers were hurt walking in it. So, you know, it strikes me that um, at this point, the Oxley Creek Transformation Project really hasn't uh, delivered on what, it, what it's promised. Um, and the big problem remains as it did then, and I think now it's probably fully understand by Mr Chemier and his team, um, that council only owns about a third of the land along Oxley Creek. Uh, a third of it is privately owned and a third of it is owned by the state government. And uh, the idea that somehow there'll be a continuous, um, you know, greenway all the way along there, I think, um, seems quite remote. Um, I'm really disappointed that, uh, that we haven't seen anything further on the Graceful project. It was not one of the six priority projects, but for some reason, which is unclear to me, they decided to move that one forward. I think that's probably because they had the DA or the master plans behind the scenes ready. I'm aware, for example, that um, even prior to the public consultation day in November last year, uh, the Oxley Creek Transformation Company took their plans to uh, the city planning team and had a pre-lodgement meeting to discuss what they wanted to do. That happened before they did any public consultation. Um, and, you know, it's really disappointing to see they're pushing a particular outcome uh, down there. Um, and certainly um, I know my residents gave a lot of feedback about that, what they wanted. Um, there is a huge uh, demand. Um, I still have the canoeing club in shipping containers. When part of Ken Fletcher Park fell into the river, which council's not bothered to fix, um, the canoeing club lost their home. And uh, for the past four, probably, yeah, good four years, maybe five years, they've been in a shipping container, or well, three shipping containers, in fact. Um, we just don't have facilities. Um, and we've got a pontoon that you can barely fit a boat down. We've got people who illegally fish off a pontoon that disabled children use. Um, we've got a boat ramp that's covered in mud that's just not usable. And if, even if you could get your boat down there, there's a locked gate rail at the top end of the car park. So you can't actually drive your boat down there. Um, you know, this council has ignored all of my requests. Um, with respect to supporting the Sea Scouts and sailability and improving the facilities down there. And um, we're still waiting to see what might come out of this uh, consultation uh, project. Um, so to date, to my knowledge, they've received about $15 million in, in council funding. Um, and I'm certainly calling on them uh, to provide a clear time frame um, for the release of uh, the release of the Graceful Riverside Parklands uh, Master Plan. I note that they asked to see me on a very specific date, um, and I think that's the 19th of October. And I'll just say publicly uh, to uh, the chairperson, she's very new, there's a state election a week later. If you're thinking about putting out any public consultation in the middle of the state election campaign, I would say that that is a terrible community outcome. It will be lost in the sea of uh, political materials that is going out. Um, so I certainly hope um, that uh, on the day that someone comes to see me, I'm not told there's a flyer going out in people's letterboxes in that same week because that's how it's worked previously. Um, and to do so in the middle of a state election campaign would be um, certainly not good practice. Um, it, it's not the right time to be putting out public uh, information about an important project. 
um, that I just hope council listens to what our residents want down there. I hope they don't over commercialise uh, the site. It's um, been a, a concern so far that I've raised directly with uh, the OCT team um, that we don't want big function centres and we don't want restaurants and you know we 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 have shops um, you know everywhere nearby and they are all struggling. Uh, so we want to see a good community facilities outcome here. We want to see upgraded um, parkland facilities. Um, we want to see the health and the mouth of the um, creek addressed. Um, and we want to see um, all of the different water-based activities that are supported in this area have an investment in those community facilities, um, not necessarily what council wants to do. And again, um, you know, it's, it's disappointing when you go and look at the files and to all the new councillors, I'll tell you, it's a very interesting process. But when you go and look at the files and you find out that someone's taken their plans uh, to the council DA team before they've even had a discussion with the community, it, it kind of indicates the fix is in. Um, so, you know, I just, as we haven't seen the master plan and it's now six months overdue, I hope it's coming soon. Further speakers? Further speakers, Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and just one quick thing to say, Mr. Chair, um, through to Councillor Johnston, through you, I may be a new councillor, but I do read the committee reports and she would do well to read the committee report too, because point 11 says that um, we will be doing online stakeholder and community engagement program in late 2020. So I'll leave it at that, thanks. I'm going to put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Councillors, the City Standards, Community Health and Safety Committee report, please. Councillor Marks. Sorry, my computer froze just at the wrong time. Yeah. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Stands Community Health and Safety Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 1st of September 2020 be adopted. Second. Councillor Toomey, the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 1st of September 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Marks? Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. Just briefly before I get to the report, I just want to say thank you to um, all the councillors who took up my offer of a ward visit. Um, I managed to visit Pullenvale, Tennyson, The Gap, Forest Lake, The Gabba, Walter Taylor, McDowell, Maruka, Inogra, Doughboy, Hamilton, Northgate, Jamboree and Coovaroo. And I thank you all for taking the time to show me around your local areas. Also, I want to quickly thank all the officers who have been very um, good in spending some time with me and allowing me to go out on the road with them. I spent some time with the urban amenities team looking at the bus stop cleaning, the drain cleaning, the street sweepers and the sign repairs. I've made visit, two visits now to the Story Bridge, been to the Willowong tra uh, Chandler transfer stations, um, been down to Trade Coast, Bracalba Quarry, Mount Cook. Coothan Botanic Gardens and a waste removal truck delivery. So um, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to walk me all through the portfolio and we have more visits to come. Um, getting onto the report, there is a committee presentation that we had with our ever lovely Holly and Emmy. Unfortunately, it was a Zoom meeting, so no one was able to see Holly and Emmy other than the council staff that were in the room at the time and they were quite delighted to see the dogs. Um, and there's two petitions, which I'm happy to leave to the debate for the chamber. Further speakers? Yes. Councillor Cumming? Yes, I, I refer to uh, item B, the petition requesting the council provide Brisbane homes with an in-home kitchen caddy and large compost bin that is collected weekly through the provision of a compost collection service. Uh, this is uh, an important petition. It's uh, calls for the implementation of a FOGO service for food organics and garden organics. Currently in Brisbane, it's estimated that there is 80,000 tonnes of FOGO going into landfill each year. As this waste decomposes, methane gas is released, which is one of the worst greenhouse gases in the, in the world. Many other councils in Australia are offering this service or a similar service now. For example, I did a Google search and there was an excellent service run by Launceston City Council and uh, Ipswich Council is starting to run a service now too. This administration is falling behind the pack. 
they in their response they refer to love food hate waste uh however when i looked at the budget for this year love uh food hate waste has been scrapped uh, as by the administration so in response to a suggested new initiative they're referring to an old program that's been scrapped and no longer being funded composting hubs are not convenient to the average brisbane resident most wards have only one hub so you have to drive across a couple of suburbs to drop off your scraps some wards have none at all uh it's a bit the, the administration doesn't seem to know how many community composting huds there are in brisbane the the response says there are more than 20 community composting hubs throughout brisbane well how many is there is there 21 or 31 or you know how, how could they not know how could they not know if it's an important issue how could you not know how many com community composting hubs there are in brisbane when I offered my community group uh, that run the hub extra publicity to encourage people to drop off uh, more, they declined because uh, they couldn't handle any more material. Uh, the compost rebate program is old hat in my view. I can recall such a service being offered about 20 years ago by the Sawley administration and despite free delivery from a service club, it never really took off and, this, and I don't think this program will be any different. As Labor councillors, we have taken upon ourselves to have a conversation with Brisbane residents. We did a community survey on FOGO. We found 58% uh, of people had not heard of FOGO before they took the survey. 46% said they composted at home. 5% only use a composting hub and 47% don't do either. That does indicate that composting hubs just aren't a viable option for the vast majority of people here in Brisbane and they won't reduce in any significant way the 80,000 tonnes of organic waste that is going into landfill. 98% of people think we should start a FOGO service here in Brisbane, and 95% of people would use that service if it was available. The top five items being put in the general bin that people would put into a FOGO bin include fruit and vegetable scraps at 91%, tea bags and coffee grinds at 80%, eggshells at 78%, weeds at 76%, and grass clippings at 76%. So people understand that this service will be a good thing to help reduce the amount of organic waste going into the general waste stream. 93% believe a FOGO bin will reduce the general waste that their household produces. This is a very clear indication that the people of Brisbane want a FOGO service. We'll be voting against this inadequate response from the administration to this petition. Further speaking, Councillor Strunk. Uh, yes, Chair, before I begin, could we, we ask for items B and C to be taken seriatim for voting purposes? Together? Uh, together, I think is fine. A will be voted on and then B and C seriatim together. Yeah. Um, listen, I'm speaking uh, on Clause uh, C, the petition uh, asking for the curbside collection uh, to be reinstated right across Brisbane um by 5421 uh residents which is uh, a very sizable petition um probably one of the biggest that we've had in this city for some time um it's disappointing in reading through the um uh, recommendation um because it's really all about it's all about uh money uh it's not about service and the service that um the Brisbane City Council uh, residents have been receiving for the last almost 20 years um, has been um, suspended for the last uh, financial year and two years forward uh, at this stage. Um, what's so disappointing is that with a $3.2 billion budget, Mr. Chair, we couldn't find savings to let this very important service go ahead over the next uh, uh, two years and and actually finish the job for the last year. That's really disappointing. And of course, um, the other the other thing, of course, is they're uh, telling people that the Good Neighbor Cleanup uh, Program or scheme is available, um, and uh, and we know that we've had problems with that. Um, you only have to look at uh, what was in the Quans today. Um, so we really, on this side, we uh, on this side, we're, we're not certainly in favor of the recommendation because we believe that this Brisbane City Council has not done what they are were contracted to do for the rates paid last year by residents 
and, um, and they should be able to find savings going forward over the next two years to reinstate this uh, valuable service. Uh, thank you, Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Allen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just uh, quickly join the debate on, uh, on item C, um, the uh, reinstatement of the curbside collection. Just uh, a bit of a trip back down uh, memory lane. Um, when the decision was made in the uh, June budget to postpone the curbside collection uh, for two years, um, it was not an easy decision. We recognised that there would be a cross section of the community who wouldn't be uh, be happy with the postponement, but it was made under um, obviously difficult uh, financial circumstances. We needed to take a responsible stance on the budget. And one of the areas where we felt we could uh, make some savings was to postpone this service for a couple of years. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that these savings have been directed to uh, support the uh, those most in need in our community. And the savings aren't uh, insubstantial uh, in the order of six and a half million dollars per annum. But um, certainly, as the Lord Mayor has said uh, previously, uh, if circumstances improve to an extent that uh, we can bring the service back earlier than two years, then that's something we will consider. So I think it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, while this is clearly a, a service that uh, many people do enjoy. It, it isn't an essential service. The uh, many council areas around Brisbane don't offer curbside collection, but we do appreciate that it is a, uh, a value add that uh, residents of Brisbane have enjoyed. Um, to that end, we'll continue to, uh, to monitor the situation. But, you know, once again, this had to be made from the perspective of, um, you know, responsible financial management. And I know that... Uh, Councillor Strunk, you'd probably fall into that uh, category. Some of your colleagues don't. Um, and that was the reason that drove the decision, a hard decision, but one that we're going to stand by none the same. Further speaking? Point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Councillor Strunk. I move the suspension of standing orders that I may be able to move a the following urgency motion, that Brisbane City Council immediately reinstates curbside collection and I'm just sending that through to you now. Thank you. For uh, circulation. By, it's been yeah. moved by um, Councillor Strunk. And I actually had Councillor Gruber seconding it as well. So, uh, Councillor Strunk, you've got three minutes to urgency, please. Mr. Chairman, this is a matter of, of urgency. If we are to address the excess growth of illegal dumping that is occurring right across Brisbane, Residents shouldn't have to put up with unwanted items in front of homes in their streets or in public green space or along roadsides and or in informal parklands. This matter is urgent because if we delay it any longer, the, suspend, the suspending of the curbside collection uh, for another two years, um, not just the 56 suburbs that were affected uh, last year that weren't collected, but the more than 180 suburbs going forward. Mr. Chairman, on the cleanup last year, one of our litter teams, clean, clean, uh, cleaning, cleanup group, literally found enough furniture to furnish a townhouse uh, alongside the underbrush of Rudd Street, Oxley. Lord Mayor, through you, Chair, you should take up you should take up a good story. You should take up the good story of the clean. Lord, sorry, <laughs> I'm getting a bit tired. Uh, Lord Mayor, um, it is it's the case that you um, always go on about uh, clean green city, right? Che talk is cheap, and you should complete last year's first, and then reinstate the next two years going forward. This valuable service, which the residents of Brisbane have grown to depend on, is urgently needed because there is now and into the future, there will be more people moving, unfortunately, because of financial circumstances due to COVID-19. And this inevitably will cause more dumping. It is urgent because the Good Neighbor Program isn't up to the job. 
And you only have to look at the Quans today to see that the 1,098 who have applied, only 661 have been approved and 639 have been completed. That means 40% have missed out and the consequences are evident. And, and if we don't urgently deal with this, our city will suffer. We have heard from residents that they, uh, that they didn't qualify and many uh, do not have the ability to be able to undertake or to be able to uh, take the um, unwanted items uh, from, their, uh, from their houses to the uh, resource centers. And so I ask that once again, that we uh, undertake curbside collection Councilor and we Clark, call upon Brisbane City Council to reinstate the collection. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Your time has expired. I'll now put the resolution on the matter of urgency. All those in favor of urgency, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. The noes have it. Division. Councillor Cassidy, Councillor Strunk, please ring the bells. On the matter of urgency, all those in favour of urgency, please say aye, or raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. 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 Thank you. And those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. Clarks, please, please read, the, read it. Please read the result when you are ready. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 17 against. The noes have it. We'll return to the substantive motion. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, thank you. I uh, rise to speak on items C and D. And I just want to check it is C and D that we are taking Sarah out and for voting purposes. Uh, no, B and C. There is no D. Okay, I would also like uh, D taken Sarah out and then please. There's no such resolution. Oh. Okay. Um, we might just keep moving, hey? Are there any other further speakers to City Standards, Community Health and Safety? Councillor Marks. No, now, that's, that's fine, Chair, yeah. thanks. I will now put the resolution. I'm speaking. No, you're, no, you're not, you've moved on. You, There's you no item D. You didn't know which report we were talking to. How, how I, I put my hand up to speak. And I'm sorry if I referred to item D, but I would like to speak and I put my hand up to speak I'm and sorry, you gave me the call. We've, we've already had the, the summation debate as well. I'll now put the resolution for item A. All those who are item A, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. On items B and C together, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. No. You guys have it? Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Strunk and Councillor Cumming. Please ring the bells. All those in favour of items B and C, please say aye and raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please no, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. Uh, Clarks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 16 in favour, five against, and one abstention. The ayes have it. Councillors, I'll now move to the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, please. Councillor Howard. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move that the report of the meeting of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee held on the 1st of September 2020 be adopted. Second. Been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of September 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Howard? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I address the committee report, I would just like to say a few words regarding the Star of Council's uh, Library Services, Sharan Harvey. And I'm sure that I speak on behalf of my predecessors in this role, Councillor Peter Maddock, former Councillor Matthew Burke, Councillor Krista Adams, and former Councillor Geraldine Knapp, when I say that, Sharan, it has been our honour to work with you and to witness the incredible passion and dedication you bring to your work each and every day and to every single person who has had the pleasure of working with you. And as we wish Sharan and her family every possible happiness in the next chapter, she will soon begin. We are very sad to say goodbye to one of the greatest leaders of this council. Sharan has truly transformed our libraries into magical places. And I know that Sharan's library services team is like a family to her. And the passion that each of our library staff has is owed in part to that environment that Sharan has created. Yeah. She has set the foundations for Australia's largest library service to continue leading the nation for years to come. And the impact of her work will not only continue to be enjoyed by every resident of Brisbane today, but so too for generations to come. So Sharan, thank you for everything you have given to this city, to this council and to your library services family. You will always have a special place in all our hearts and every person who has had the pleasure of working with you. Uh, and Mr. Chair, moving to the committee, we have uh, we had three petitions presented Point to the. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, I would just like to clarify um, a rule of procedure with you. Um, I put up my hand to speak on uh, the last committee report. Um, and I sought to clarify the items for voting purposes, yep. but then you prevented me from speaking uh, to the report. Could you please advise me under which rule that mm. you exercised um, that decision? You didn't understand which report we were speaking to. You'd stop speaking and we moved on. Councilor. No, Mr. Chairman, that's not the case. And I indicated to you that I wanted to speak and I was simply seeking to clarify uh, which items we did we that, but then you did not let me speak. No, no. So I'm just asking you what the me. rule of procedure is, please. Uh, I've already advised you what happened, Councillor Howard. No, no, I understand what Chair, happened. I'm asking you what the, the committee. Rule of procedure is, please, that you're using to prevent me from speaking on an item at council. You weren't prevented. You just didn't do it, Councillor Howard. No, you, Thank you, 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 Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. To the committee report. That's not the... Councillor Howard, please continue. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, to the committee report, we had three petitions presented order. to the committee. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. I move dissent in your ruling. It's the second time tonight I've been prevented from speaking um, when the chair has no, not... No debate. There is no debate of, of procedural motions. Is there a seconder? No. Councillor Howard, please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, to the committee report, we had three petitions presented to committee, along with a presentation um, by Louise Bazina, the Artistic Director of Brisbane Festival, who, as everyone has uh, heard, has gone above and beyond in delivering such an amazing offer of activities and events for us to enjoy in this year's Brisbane Festival. This year's program has been designed in a way that people can enjoy it together without gathering together. And it's great to see so many residents excited about the festival with some events already booked out. So I do encourage everyone to support the Brisbane Festival. And on that note, Mr Chair, I will commend the report to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I'll be speaking on items B, C and D and ask that they be taken seriatim for voting. Uh, together. together. It's fine. So items A, item A and then items B, C and D voting together. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, these items are the petitions regarding the Balbari Pool and the petition requesting Council provide an immediate financial rescue package for struggling sporting and community clubs. Firstly, Mr Chair, on the Balbari Pool, uh, here we have two petitions signed by community members of the Pullenvale Ward 
asking for their local pool to remain open year round and for heating to allow that to happen. Mr Chair, as a council, so we regularly see petitions regarding community facilities and this community has done the right thing in raising these issues with council and it is timely given the lease renewal process for this particular site. However, uh, what we have seen in the council's response to this petition, which is supported uh, by the local councillor, Councillor Adaman, is what we see time and time again in the city, an acknowledgement of petitioners' concerns but no real action to actually address them. This is the prime example where council could actually do something. They could uh, put a provision in the tender document specifically asking for these requirements to be met by those looking to tender for this pool. Uh, they could actively take steps to assess the costs of these improvements and commit to partnering with the new lessee to ensure that they are delivered. Um, but this LNP Council chooses to do none of those things. They simply acknowledge the concerns and they will say they will favourably consider if someone who tenders so happens to include these issues raised by petitioners. This is a community, Mr Chair, asking for changes to be made to a council community facility. And this council simply doesn't listen. They pick and choose when to help and when to ignore the community. This is a pattern of behaviour that we see time and time again across the city. In committee, I asked uh, the Chair, Councillor Howard, if she would specifically include a clause in the tender documents to address these residents' concerns. She was straight up and said no. I cannot fathom why the local councillor would not be fighting to include these provisions in that process. I'm not sure if uh, he doesn't think that's a good idea or he simply does not care or had he not considered the alternatives. I'm sure that he will uh, stand up this evening and tell us his reasons as he has done on previous occasions on other issues in his local area. So I'm sure uh, that tonight he'll do that again and we'll get to hear exactly what he has to say about them. We will not be supporting uh, these items today as the response does not provide adequate explanation and does not adequately address residents' concerns on what should be a uh, issue that Council addresses as a matter of course through the tender process. It also doesn't give a good enough reason as to why the LMP and the local councillor don't appear to care. On item D, the request for council to provide an immediate financial rescue package. Mr Chair, this petition was launched by Labor and was signed by over 1,200 residents from across the city. We launched this petition in response to COVID and the need to support our struggling community clubs. As I've said before, Mr Chair, um, community clubs and organisations are the heart and soul of our communities. We must do everything we can to support them. When this petition was launched, the LNP had done nothing to help, genuinely help, our struggling clubs. They had hidden behind water rebates from the previous year uh, for a small number of organisations whilst ripping millions of dollars in support for these groups behind the scenes through the budget process. No doubt, uh, Councillor Howard will tell us tonight, as she did during the budget, that there have been no cuts, that programs uh, throughout this uh, area have simply been moved to COVID recovery. But time and time again, this LNP Council completely misses the mark that specific programs like men's shed grants have indeed been cut and in reality, these organisations are now thrown into a larger, more competitive environment with lower opportunity for grant success. However, uh, Mr Chair, I will acknowledge there was a silver lining from this petition that was presented back in May, Mr Chair, and that was that the LNP finally committed to the direct financial assistance of $3 million, which was able to be accessed by those groups on council lease sites only. And I know in my own ward, Mr Chair, many 
community organisations have taken up those grants and I acknowledge that that is a good outcome from this petition. However, Mr Chair, make no mistake that there is no way this LNP Council would have made this cash commitment without this petition and without Labor consistently calling for immediate and direct financial support. Mr Chair, despite this fund, our clubs remain on their knees. They need more support, both financial and in-kind from Council. They need to be treated like they are in a partnership with Council, not simply tenants, where Council is the big bad landlord looking for ways to make their life more difficult. Our role is not one only of compliance. It should actually be one of partnership. We should not be looking for ways to kick out clubs from their homes of over 20 years, strictly enforcing the rules to the detriment of our hard-working volunteers. We should do better, and this response should have been more comprehensive and provide more support. For those reasons, we won't be supporting the recommended response today because it simply states what has already occurred. It does not provide a pathway forward to where further improvements and further investment can be made to help our clubs who are not yet out of danger and won't be for some time to come. And can I just preempt? I am sure that Councillor Howard will probably say, oh, look, nothing's good enough for Labor. They always want to spend more. I want to be really clear. This is not just about financial support. This is about a culture and a sentiment within this council and their treatment of our community organisations, our community spaces, and the way that we deal with these organisations and volunteers. There needs to be a change. It has been 16 years that this council has had to address some of these issues, and they have simply not done it. And again, I don't know if this is because the LNP simply doesn't care. I don't know if it's because they don't want to invest. Um, I think that Councillor Howard should answer those questions tonight and tell us why it is that only after being pushed will they actually provide any response to these organisations who are struggling and why that we have to constantly battle with council on behalf of our community clubs to get the help and support and, quite frankly, the respect that they deserve. Thank you, Mr Chair. Councillor Johnston. Geez, I wouldn't want you to miss me. Uh, I rise to speak on item D, um, the uh, financial rescue package for sporting clubs and community clubs. Um, I take a slightly different approach to uh, Councillor Cook, but I certainly um, agree with many of the things that she said. Um, firstly, can I say um, that our uh, community and sporting clubs are massively uh, struggling. They have been for a very long time. And out my way, they don't get $9 million to build a dog racing track. Um, they barely get money to fix the toilets where 2,500 girls play netball every week. Um, so the clubs in my ward have to do it themselves and they rely on the grants that council has to offer. And unfortunately, um, during uh, this financial year, um, things have got worse for the clubs in my area, not better. Um, and I certainly understand why so many people uh, signed this petition. I'm going to talk about all the grants that have been cut, um, which has put more pressure back on clubs. Let me start with the Lord Mayor's Community Fund. That's been cut by more than half. Um, that's just, uh, you know, an appalling decision in a year when we need to fund uh, groups locally. Um, and to cut that funding um, when it was not necessary, um, you know, I put forward a viable alternative that uh, the LNP refused to consider, which was introducing um, a scheme to approve the funding. I note that they were able to do it um, with the COVID money uh, that's put aside for uh, Capital Works. But of course, um, simply because I proposed it, I presume the Lord Mayor uh, decided it was uh, not something he would accept. Um, but we could have had a, an approvals process in place through the committee structure using a similar model to the parks and 
uh, footpath trust fund monies. Um, and unfortunately, this LNP administration chose to cut local grant funding. And to be honest, that's disgusting. Um, but that's not the half of it. Um, the truth is actually really out there now about what this administration has done. Here are some of the other grants that have been cut for the year. These are grants that our clubs rely on um, without question. Um, the LNP has cut the Community Development and Capacity Building Grants. That's up to $10,000. The Healthy and Physical Activity Grants, they're up to $20,000. They've been cut. The Access and Inclusion Grants, up to $50,000, they've been cut. The Building Stronger Communities and Grants Program, this is the workhorse area where clubs get money to improve their capital uh, facilities. This is money that clubs in my ward rely on. Those grants are up to $100,000, they've been cut. Uh, uh, the Men's Shed uh, Grants Program, up to $20,000, um, that program has also been cut. Uh, the uh, Lord Mayor's Helen Taylor Research Awards for Local History, up to $20,000, that program's been cut. The Historical Organisations Assistance Grants Program, up to $10,000, that program has been cut. The Creative Sparks Grants Program, that program, uh, up to $10,000, has been cut. Uh, the Lord Mayor's Young and Emerging Artist Fellowships, that program is up to $20,000, that program has been cut. Uh, the Brisbane History Grants, uh, up to $20,000, that program has been cut. And the Innovation Grants Program, up to $30,000, that program has been cut. That's, you know, 15 odd programs that this Lord Mayor has cut the funding for, putting even more pressure on our community and sporting clubs when there are no grants available for them. Now that leads me into um, what this LNP administration is trying to sell, which is the Lord Mayor's COVID-19 Direct Assistance Program. Um, those program grants are up to $10,000. They are only available to clubs on community leased council land. In my ward, there are dozens of groups that are ineligible because they are on church land they are on land that they own because the community all put in a pound each 100 years ago and bought the land. They're not wealthy. Um, they can barely upkeep their facilities, but they're not eligible for any grant this year um, because this administration has drawn up the criteria in a way that excludes them. Then there are a number of groups that are on uh, state government land um, and all of these groups, kindies, RSLs, community centres, um, guides, uh, you name it, there are so many groups um, that are missing out on the $10,000 COVID grant and there is not a single other grant that they can apply for with council this year other than the Lord Mayor's community funds, which the Lord Mayor cut. I cannot believe the goal of this administration, this LNP administration, um, to claim that it is out there helping groups when all they have done this year is to cut the grant funding that is available, uh, to restrict the access to the COVID-19 grants so that legitimate and needy community groups miss out. Kindies miss out. Quinder Christian Kindy, because they're located on church grounds, they're not eligible. It's private property. Um, you know, it is just appalling to watch this administration um, neglect clubs because they're not based on council land. Um, to me, this is one of the uh, most appalling aspects of this program. Um, it clearly demonstrates that the Lord Mayor is aren't aware how much community life in this city happens um, that's not on council leased land. Um, and these groups are being deliberately starved of funds this year. Um, they're desperate to keep going and they are struggling. They are really, really struggling. And the council's response to this is to cut the grant funding that is normally available to them, to restrict eligibility um, to the one grant that, that looks like it might be available to them but isn't. And the result is dozens and dozens of community groups who are going to miss out on any kind of council support this year. 
Now, I wrote to the Lord Mayor about this. He wrote back a really juvenile and pathetic response saying, take it up with the state government if they're on state government land. Um, but what about the church land? What about the private property? There's just, it. you know, if the federal government said, no, we're not giving grants to any group that's on uh, council land, half this the stuff that happens in this council wouldn't happen. If the state government did the same thing, none of our sporting clubs would actually get the, you know, sporting grants. It's so short-sighted, it's so mean-spirited, and it is so pathetic um, that at a time when we should be supporting community life in this city, when people are at home, they are in their neighbourhoods, they their whole world has been reduced down to what is happening in their community, um, this LNP administration has cut the funds available to them. Now, you know, 1,200 people have signed a petition calling on council for support. And I appreciate that Councillor Cook thinks um, the COVID grants are good. They are, but they do not, they do not even um, cover the ordinary grants that have been cut by this administration this year. And there are dozens of groups that have been disenfranchised by the narrowly drawn criteria. And that is a poor reflection upon this um, LNP administration. It is stingy, it is mean-spirited, um, and it's incredibly disappointing that many groups will not see a single cent um, from council to help them through um, that significant hardship that they are experiencing. Um, we've got tiny little volunteer groups in my area whose only source of income is through their halls. They can't lease their hall out, they can't do anything, um, um, but they're not eligible for any grants from council. Um, I, I, I just think that, you know, I don't know what the rest of the LNP councillors are doing in there. I mean, do you not pay attention to what's happening in your own communities? I can't be the only one with dozens of community clubs and community groups that are going to miss out altogether from any little bit of funding from this council simply because mm. no one will speak up, no one will say to the Lord Mayor, you need to broaden the criteria and you need to reinstate some of these grants. Um, millions of dollars in advertising money can be found, millions of dollars for TV and ads and surveys, but we can't find a little bit of money to help our community groups. It is not good enough. So let me be clear. Um, it, it, it's some sleight of hand you've got going with these COVID grants because you have cut nearly every other grant um, that council normally offers. And that is out there now and our groups are aware of it. Um, and I can tell you they are disappointed um, and it is distressing to see them um, experiencing such hardship uh, without any support from this council. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy? Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I would just like to speak on Clause D briefly tonight. And, and the response here is outlined by Councillor Cook um, to this petition, which was a significant petition and a cry for help uh, from people who are mostly, I think, associated with uh, community uh, organisations and sporting clubs around our city, a cry for help to this administration, and that's fallen largely on deaf ears. They were dragged, kicking and screaming to respond with the, um, the piecemeal and fairly anemic response that they have come up with. Uh, but, but overall, the level of support and the disdain that our um, community and sporting clubs are treated with by this administration, by this Lord Mayor, by uh, Councillor Howard, tells you all you need to know about their priorities, Chair. Uh, when we raise the issue of um, the cost of water for our um, council leased sporting organisations, um, uh, those organisations, uh, some of them will be eligible for a $5,000 rebate, uh, which is temporary. Uh, some of those clubs in my area and surrounding wards uh, are faced with thirty dollars to $40,000 uh, in water bills at the moment, particularly. They've had uh, no income, um, very little um, in the way of playing sports, very little in the way of canteen sales, and they're still um, considered uh, that they need to uh, maintain those fields by council. Uh, they have to pay those bills. Uh, and every time this is raised, this administration, um, as is this Lord Mayor's way, he blames someone else. And, and when it comes to water, he says it's all the state government's fault. Uh, it's never his fault. It's never... Uh, his problem to fix, Chair. Uh, but what we know is what came through these reports earlier in the ENC, that $200 million in pure, cold, hard cash 
comes to this council from QUU, from water. We own the water retailer, or 85 per cent of it, uh, and when this administration says we can't possibly help with community clubs' water needs because it's not our problem. We've got nothing to do with water, says this Lord Mayor, uh, and yet he's willing to accept $200 million uh, in water profits. Um, I think that absolutely stinks, Chair. And all of those clubs, not just in the Deegan Ward, but in the Brackenridge Ward and the Marchant Ward and the Northgate Ward and the Inaugural Ward uh, and, and those wards right across the city, of which uh, we have been telling those uh, community clubs that, uh, they are starting to get very, very annoyed with this administration's response. Now, these, these community clubs, these sporting clubs, are not run by professionals. They're not businesses. They are community organisations, the backbones of our community. They're mums and dads and grandparents and family and friends. They don't go there and do it for money. They do it for uh, the love of their families and their communities. Uh, you know, and then when they're told uh, by this administration that uh, those grant programs have to end because... Um, you know, council's running out of money, and yet they see that $200 million comes in in uh, cold hard cash as a profit from water sales. They see tonight that the Lord Mayor's ad budget continues to rise, uh, reaching close to $2 million uh, in the last couple of years. And they see that the Lord Mayor spent $250,000 uh, contracting Ipsos, a political polling company, uh, to get his message just right in the lead up to the last election. Uh, they get um, quite upset, Chair, and you can understand why. So this response to this petition is inadequate uh, in the very least. Uh, it is appalling in the very worst. Uh, these uh, clubs are the backbone of our community and the disdain in which this administration continues to show for them will be a shocking legacy for them. We know that clubs are shutting their doors now and some of them will never, ever reopen. Uh, that was revealed in recent questions on notice. It will be your legacy, Councillor Howard, and this Lord Mayor's legacy when more of these clubs close because you continue to sit on your hands, you continue to take the big bucks, you continue to take the allowances, uh, and you continue to advertise yourself at the expense of our community clubs. That is your legacy. Uh, further speakers? Anyone? Councillor Howard. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, well, Mr Chair, um, let me first of all um, make some comments about item B and item C, the Balbarry pool. And as I advised in committee last week, and as stated in the petition background, when council resumes the tender process, any proposals to install heating and expand the length of the of the opening season will be favourably considered. I don't think that can be any more clear. Turning to um, item D, when the coronavirus pandemic hit Brisbane, our connected communities immediately took to the phones and they contacted hundreds and hundreds of our community lessees to ask them what they needed. And they told us what they needed. They needed urgent financial assistance. And that is exactly what we have done. We've adapted our funding to support their needs. And that is why the Lord Mayor responded with a range of immediate support measures. Our community groups are doing it tough. Nobody denies that. And the Schroeder administration is doing everything possible to help them get through this unprecedented time. We took early action to help these organisations ensure that lease fees and other charges to council were waived. We then announced that we would help struggling sports clubs by providing a one or $5,000 grant so that they could water their fields ahead of reopening. We've urged the state government over and over to reduce the state bulk water charge, which is the biggest single cost on clubs' water bills. Unfortunately, they've not listened. Nothing. Crickets. And you have to wonder, Mr Chair, if this has anything to do with the state government's reckless financial management. In stark contrast to Labor, the Liberal National Party has a strong track record of responsible financial membership, uh, financial ma management. And this is something that we're proud to have delivered for the residents of Brisbane. 
the 16 years of responsible economic management that the LNP has delivered for the city means that Brisbane now has the economic resilience that we need to get through this pandemic and to keep delivering the services our city needs. Despite the impacts of the pandemic, the Schroeder administration has now delivered for Brisbane 17 consecutive years of balanced budgets. Despite the impacts of coronavirus, we are investing more than $29 million in local sport, recreation, cultural and community facilities in this year's budget. Mr Chair, this $29 million investment is in addition to the Lord Mayor's $3 million COVID-19 direct assistance package. The Lord Mayor's COVID-19 direct assistance package is providing $3 million in direct assistance for community groups on council land to help them get through this pandemic. It's not only helping clubs pay bills that are piled up during their forced closure, it will also support leaseholders who've been unable to do maintenance works on their buildings due to the lack of revenue due to COVID-19. So through you, Mr Chair, I want to thank our dedicated officers in Council's Connected Communities team that has been working around the clock to make sure that our clubs can access this funding support as soon as possible. And on that note, I recommend it to the Chamber. Thank you. I'll now put item A of the resolution. Item A, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. On items B, C and D, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. no. Ayes have it. Division. Division. Councillor Adams and Councillor Cook, I think. Uh, please ring the bells. On items B, C and D, all those in favour, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Oh. Aye. And those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. no. Clarks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 18 in favour, six against and one abstention. The ayes have it. Councillors, I will now move to the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee. Uh, Councillor Allen. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 1st of September 2020, be adopted. Seconded. Moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Huang. The report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of September 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Allen? Uh, Mr Chair, at last week's meeting we had a committee presentation on the divisional ICT roadmaps and a committee report, bank and investment report for July 2020, and I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Allen? I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye and raise your hand. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Uh, councillors, are there any petitions? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I've got a petition from residents of Kangaroo Point calling for the reinstatement of the, the uh, city hopper ferries and an explanation as to why they were taken off the water. Councillor Allen. Mr Chair, I've got a petition recognition of our cultural heritage in Brisbane City Council meetings. Councillor Johnston. Yes, I'm tabling a petition on behalf of residents calling for pedestrian safety improvements on Dewar Terrace Sherwood. Any other petitions? May I please have a resolution to accept them? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Seconded. <clears throat> Moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Griffiths, that all, peti all petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. 
All those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Council's general business. Are there any uh, matters of... Um, are there any statements required as a result of an Office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? Are there any matters of general business? Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Mr Chair. I just wanted to acknowledge over the past week some local legends in the Jamboree Ward. I wanted to start with a group of locals who saved a home in Windermere last week. I want to put on record, Mr Chairman, the incredible bravery of Jeremy Kelly, who on his way home from work spotted some black smoke and was curious enough to investigate. Luckily he did, as a gas bottle in, the in a backyard barbecue had exploded. Racing towards the flames, Jeremy extinguished the fire with the help of neighbours Armando Pipia, Ben Thompson and Diane Hainan. Their quick thinking and fast action saved a home, saved this family home and the residents went above and beyond. So I wanted to formally say thank you. Some more local legends are our centenary salvos. Last Sunday over a wood fire pizza and ice cream, I joined with the community and founding members Albert and Marilyn Gittens, Julie and Steve Cardiff, and Bert and Janelle Mudderwatt to celebrate 30 years of serving the community. This church began in Middle Park State School in September 1990 before establishing their own site across the road just a few years later. These salvos have made a significant contribution to our community, most visibly during emergencies, including transforming their venue into a relief centre during the floods. Their quieter achievements include supporting the centenary high chaplaincy program, providing financial support and meals to those in need through their connection program and prison gate ministry, offering support and guidance to those visiting loved ones behind bars. Finally, I would like to acknowledge Catherine Philpott uh, leading, the, leading this powerful community. I look forward to continuing to partner with you to make an even bigger impact in our community. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge the Centenary Meals on Wheels. I joined their delivery team last week to see firsthand the difference they make every day. In these times, connection and conversation have never been so important. I want to acknowledge the unwavering commitment and generosity of these volunteers, led by the wonderful President Judy Murphy. Thank you for continuing to brighten the days of these locals. It is definitely not a drop and go service with every volunteer taking the time to stay and chat. Thank you. Further general business, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on a couple of um, matters. Uh, firstly, I have to close pregnancy pain. Oh, please continue. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, there was just some interference there. Um, uh, firstly, lure coursing, uh, and um, <laughs> which you know, it's a bit interesting, but I'll, I'll get to that. And then secondly, um, rules of procedure. Uh, firstly, I didn't have time to address this earlier in the ENC uh, committee, um, but I did learn something uh, new today uh, at council, um, not uh, the rules of procedure from the deputy chairman who clearly doesn't know them, but um, in the uh, contracts, we had an item for $9 million for construction of the Wally Tate Park upgrade. And I thought, I don't really know where Wally Tate Park is. So I did a little bit of research um, earlier today and found that it's out in Runcorn in Councillor Mark's area. Um, and there is an, a nifty description of uh, what council is going to be doing out there in Wally Tate Park for the $9 million. And this is where um, the Queensland Lure Coursing Association is going to have its new head office. And here I was thinking, oh, my goodness, I didn't realise there was a lake or a river or something out there and, and there was fishing out there in Councillor um, Marx's ward. But um, if there is any other Brisbane resident or councillor like me who did not know what lure coursing is, um, it is where um, bags are put onto rope and rope is pulled along at a very fast rate and motorbike engines are revved and dogs chase plastic bags. Um, now, I'm reading from the, um, well, I've, the document that I've got is uh, uh, from the Queensland Lure Coursing Association uh, website. So I was a little bit surprised at um, why we'd be investing $9 million into something that encourages uh, dogs to chase plastic bags out in the open. Um, and, 
you know, I, I would have thought just from a sort of environmental and a biodiversity point of view that encouraging dogs to chase things out in the open, probably not such a good idea. Um, you know, we wouldn't want them taking off after a local bird or some other uh, wildlife. Um, but apparently uh, Lua coursing is a very big uh, event. Um, it hails from Germany and it is delightful to see that they're getting a $9 million purpose-built facility out there at Runcorn. Uh, the Caribbean Cricket Club, Club will be co-located uh, with them. Um, but I'm really interested in finding out how big the Queensland Lua Coursing Association uh, is. Um, I had never, ever heard of it um, before. And I have to um, admit, it sounds very similar to greyhound racing uh, to me. Uh, however, this is obviously um, informal and uh, not for any kind of uh, race, professional race type purposes. Um, I just, I just wonder about what you need to do in other parts of the city to have some investment in your sporting facilities. I mean. Um, if I'd known all it took was to get the Queensland Lua Coursing Association to co-locate uh, with my local cricket club, I'm sure South would have loved that. Unfortunately, they had to uh, pay for their own field upgrade. Um, and uh, of the $100,000 in uh, money they got from council from last year's grants that have been cancelled, uh, council took $60,000 back in fees and charges. It's just obscene, obscene. Um, this poor volunteer junior cricket club um, basically got nothing from council um, other than a lot of heartache, I can tell you. Um, but meanwhile, I'm very pleased for the Queensland Lua Coursing Association who are going to get a $9 million purpose-built facility so the dogs can chase plastic bags around uh, presumably the cricket pitch uh, on the back of motorbikes. I'm sure that's going to be a wonderful addition uh, to the um, Brisbane, um, uh, well, I don't even know what I want to say about that. Finally, with respect to the rules of procedure. Earlier today, um, the Deputy Chairman, uh, Stephen, Councillor Stephen Toomey, made a very bad mistake. Now, I preface this by saying Councillor Toomey is a very decent person, but today, um, he's made a very, very um, poor decision. And um, the sad part of it is uh, it um, clearly, when he read out what the rule was, he was unable to apply that rule to the circumstances. So I just want to go back to um, this good order video conferencing rules. It says the following about urgency motions. And this is the same mistake that uh, you, Mr. Chairman, made last week um, in denying an urgency motion at that point. It says, if a councillor successfully moves an urgency motion, a copy of the wording of the motion is to be immediately emailed to the council and committees uh, to facilitate the uh, motion. It's very clear that it is prefaced upon a successful urgency motion being moved. Both last week and again this week, I have been prevented from moving an urgency motion. That is contrary to the rules of procedure upon which we have been told this meeting is being conducted. It is extremely disappointing um, uh, to see that both the chairman and the deputy chairman are unaware of what the rules of procedure are saying, and that is we can move urgency, and then if that urgency motion is successful, a written motion is required uh, to be provided, which will be circulated to councillors. Now, that is clearly the written advice that we've got. In the 12 years that I have been here in the council chamber, that is the way that it has been done until last week. So 12 years of doing it in one way, and then last week, it was different. Um, so I will be taking this further. I'll just say I'm sick and tired of being told these are the rules that you have to follow. And then when I follow them, um, both the chairman and the deputy chairman say, no, 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 those aren't the rules. Well, today, 
Um, the deputy chairman gave us those rules. He then deliberately um, refused to recognise the rule and allow me to move an urgency motion. Both Councillor Shree and myself, in good faith, put forward the problem with what was being suggested, and that was ignored. Um, that means it was a deliberate act to prevent me from speaking. That was the first time that happened tonight. The second time that it happened tonight, um, the chairman, Councillor Andrew Wines, prevented me from speaking on a council matter. Again, that's not a power that the chairperson has. They can rule certain things out of order, but they can't prevent a councillor from speaking uh, on matters before there. If there is a pause by any other councillor for longer than one or two seconds, you can be sure now that I'm going to raise it. And I'm certain, for example, when the Lord Mayor... Um, please do not threaten to use vexatious points of order. Uh, as you know, vexatious points of order are an act of disorder uh, and you will not be permitted to do them into the, uh, at any point. Well, I didn't make a point of order and you're threatening me now. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm speaking in general business okay. about matters that I said I was speaking in general I'm business about you. and now you are threatening me and that is unacceptable. No, Councillor Johnston, it was you who threatened me and all other councillors by threatening to use vexatious points of order into the future. I just wanted That's to. That's not what I did, and I'm allowed to make a speech about the things that I said I'm speaking about, and you do not have any right to tell me I can't speak. Again. At no so... point did I tell you you couldn't speak. At no point did I say you couldn't speak. You just interrupted me That's to tell I me and threatened me. Speak. All right, I did not. I absolutely you do not have the power to do so. Now, let's be clear. The rule tonight that you decided was if there is a break in speech uh, at all, that's it. You don't get to speak anymore. Now, I note that earlier in the meeting, the Lord Mayor took very long pauses while he had to look for a piece of paper and no one jumped down his throat. You gave him the benefit of the doubt and gave him a few seconds uh, to find his piece of paper that he was referring to. And I note that's not a courtesy that you bothered extending to me. Now so please don't true. threaten me. Uh, you set up the rules the way you want to set them up. That is not true. Uh, I am more tolerant towards you than any other councillor in this place. I give you a great deal of leniency. Uh, you uh, Still my general business. I don't know what you're doing. Right? This is my no, general no, no, business. No, no. No, you badger and threaten me constantly, and I will not. I will not put up with this vexatious. You are the one doing that. I I'm speaking in my general business session about the things that I raised. You Councilor, are the one threatening me. Your time has expired. Further speakers, Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I like to speak in general business on the Tarragindi Community Garden, which is a very exciting new adventure in uh, Tarragindi in the Holland Park Ward. Uh, it has been an absolutely fantastic success already, uh, regardless of the fact that we have had obviously some issues with uh, COVID and uh, restrictions on gathering there. The opening happened in the, the brief moment where restrictions were relieved a little bit through uh, July, and we got a fantastic turnout of hundreds of people interested in being involved. Renee, McBride has do an, done an absolutely fantastic job. She is a, a nurse at the Children's Hospital in Brisbane where she's done community garden work there. She recognised early the significance of people being out and about and in the garden as being a bit of a mental health as well as a physical health and social uh, well-being aspect. And when she approached me about the community garden, I was more than happy to support her and get it up and running. Uh, it's fantastic to see the Wellers Hills Bowls Club have now um, sublet a part of their area uh, for the community garden and uh, it's been a great success not just for the community garden but for extra members to the Wellers Hills Bowls Club as well who are another community group who are extremely happy with the support they have thank you Councillor Howard um, through you Mr Chair um, through our COVID relief and uh, the numbers are doing extremely well down there we launched it online we did have a big event planned last week but it had to be online uh, and with the introduction of the Tarragindi Community Garden and I'm very excited to say that we also now have a composting hub in Holland Park and the composting uh, 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 tubs are available from my ward office um, so that you can come and support the community garden as well. So can I say well done to Renee, uh, to the wider community that are getting involved even in these difficult times and I think we're going to go from strength to strength as we get people back on the ground and we can gather together. So thank you very much.
further speakers. Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like, I'm rising to speak tonight on a couple of local legends in the Hamilton Ward. Um, and I'm, uh, I know they'll be embarrassed for me to name them, but uh, Megan and Anthony Elliott, who started um, a wonderful program in my ward at the Brothers Rugby Club, the modified rugby program to provide a great uh, sporting opportunity for boys and girls with disabilities. And that's grown into a statewide rugby program, modified rugby program, uh, supported by a foundation that they've established called the Ginger Cloud Foundation. But I just wanted to recognise a federal government grant that they've been successful in receiving um, through a program that I hadn't heard about, to be honest, until I heard about this grant to them, $940,000 they've received for, through a, a federal government program called the Information Linkage and Capacity Building program through the NDIS and what a wonderful program it is to provide and train for uh, mentors for future players uh, and to uh, provide for a mentor program for future players. So um, this program is about inclusion, creating connections between people with disabilities and communities in which they live. Um, and it provides grants to organisations that provide that outcome. And that's certainly what the Modified Rugby Program, the Ginger Cloud Foundation does in spades. And uh, as I say, a shout out to Megan and to Anthony Elliott for starting that program, to watching it grow throughout the Brisbane region and now beyond throughout the state of Queensland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers, Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just uh, one, uh, one item tonight in general business, and I just want to uh, um, put out a big uh, shout out to the Oxley uh, Dara, the Dara Oxley Pony Club, who held their first uh, gym Kana, uh, this uh, this last Sunday. Uh, can can you hear us? Sorry, I can. I can. No, please continue. Oh, it keeps my, uh, um, my ward office here that's actually failing. Councillor Strunk, would you like us to return to you? I think there's another general... Hear, if you can still hear me, um, yeah. I can't... Yeah. No, I think... Maybe we might, there's another general business, I think, and we might come back to you, all right? Councillor Huang. GB. Point of order. Oh. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yes, Mr Chairman. If Councillor Strunk's not speaking, then you've got to move on and you can't go back to him because that's what I asked and you said no. And I'm no. sure you want to apply your new rule fairly. No, no, absolutely. I've, I've always applied that rule exactly the same way. Councillor Huang. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to speak Point briefly. Of Point of order, Councillor Johnston. I move dissent in your ruling because clearly you've applied it in one way to him and a different way to me. Is there a, sec is there a seconder? There is no seconder. Councillor Huang. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to uh, speak briefly on the opening of a new business on Brisbane's south side and uh, the implications for Brisbane's economy. Recently, I was invited to the ribbon cutting ceremony of Annam Consultancy Group. Annam is a migration and education consultancy firm started by a former Brisbane International Student Ambassador, Ms. Jen Du. Ms. Jen Du was an international student from Vietnam, and she has decided to stay in Australia after she completed her study. At the ribbon cutting, Jen told me what inspired her to stay and started her own business in Brisbane was the uh, deciding fa uh, the deciding factor was the support and uh, the welcoming attitude she has received from Brisbane City Council and our successive law mayors, namely Grant Quirk and Adrian Trina. Of course, as some, someone of Vietnamese ori origin, Jen has strong connection in Vietnam and she's determined to strengthen the business and cultural networks between Brisbane and Vietnam. Whilst attending the event, I also asked Jane, would it be more challenging to start up a business under the current COVID environment? I was told 
Yes, it may be challenging, but it also represents new and different opportunities, and they have strong confidence in Brisbane. Jane believes that Brisbane is in a safe hand and is heading in the right direction, which is so important to this in these uncertain times. I was touched by the response and thankful to the trust they have placed in our city and our administration. Mr. Chair, we often talk about voting with one's feet. Can I say Enam is giving our city that vote of confidence by opening up a new business and having such a positive outlook for the future of our city. I would like to once again congratulate the opening of Ennam and look forward to their entrepreneurship and wish them every success. Further general business? Councillor Adaman. Uh, thank you, Chair. I rise to speak about uh, Brookfield Road and my ward and the ongoing issues around traffic safety. Councillors might recall that last year the speed limit on Brookfield Road approaching the general store was reduced from 60 km an hour to 50 km, and one of the seven SAM signs in my ward is permanently located nearby. But signage alone doesn't prevent accidents, and with the Brookfield State School nearby, there is an ongoing need for motorists, parents and children to play their part and remain alert. Unfortunately, a few weeks ago, a young schoolgirl was hit by a motorist as she attempted to cross Brookfield Road after school. The good news, after speaking to her father, is that she's OK. It was timely that the following week a meeting was convened by the local school principal that included key stake, uh, state and local government officers and other key stakeholders to look at potential solutions. It's something that I have been discussing with my colleague, the Infrastructure Chair, Councillor McLaughlin. Separately, my state counterpart, the member for Mogul, has been looking at having an easement through the state-owned showgrounds regazetted to give the school frontage to Brookfield Road and therefore an automatic 40 km speed limit before and after school hours. But safety concerns on Brookfield Road are not just confined to school days. With the very popular Brookfield markets are held on every first and third Saturday of each month, there are patrons looking for parking, pony club members with horse floats accessing the paddock across the road, visitors to the cemetery, joggers and groups of cyclists who traditionally finish their Saturday morning ride at the general store, all competing to use the road. I've discussed this issue at length with the Brookfield Showgrounds Trust, which manages the entire reserve on behalf of the state government. In the interests of community safety, the trust has decided to relocate the markets to its original site of its DA, which will not only give the operator more space, but will ensure market parking will access the site from Boscombe Road, eliminating the need for market parking on Brookfield Road. I commend and thank the trust for taking this proactive measure. Anything that helps reduce traffic congestion and in turn ensures the ongoing safety of our community has my support. This is a good start, and I will continue to work with other stakeholders for effective, permanent traffic solutions. Thank you. Further yeah, general business? Very cool. Councillor Strunk, we'll have another go. Here you go. See if you. Councillor Strunk? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we'll have uh, another go. Thanks for uh, James in, in IT trying to get me up and going again. Um, listen, I, there was just one uh, item for general business, and that was the uh, uh, Dara Oxley uh, Pony Club's uh, Jacana Day on Sunday. Uh, there was a great turnout. 11 clubs uh, from right across uh, Brisbane and Logan uh, came to the Gym Kana, and um, there was uh, 54, uh, um, 54, um, uh, <laughs> it has been a long day, uh, participants. And, um, and it was just really pleasurable to actually be out in the fresh air uh, with, a, with a, an event um, since this COVID-19 has been uh, so disruptive to a lot of events uh, since March. And uh, it was just amazing to see the turnout and the support that this club was getting from 10 other clubs. And uh, I just want to congratulate Ash, who uh, was the organizer from the uh, Dara Oxley Pony Club and, uh, and, and her management team as well, who did a terrific job pulling it all together. Um, it was a great day. And uh, I just look forward to uh, um, going to the next one because it was uh, just so pleasurable to be out and about again. Thank you, Chair. Further, further general business. Thank you. That was an excellent session, everyone. Well done. I declare the meeting closed.